Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mediating Freedom from Human Rights to Contemporary Art, our last seminar from our fall 2016 session. We're here with Victoria Ivanova, the instructor of the seminar, and I'm going to pass the mic and the video to Victoria to begin the class. Go ahead, Victoria. Well, hi, everyone. Now a more official welcome to the course. Um, and today <clears throat> I want to do a couple of different things. So first of all, I want to kind of introduce myself and to contextualize uh, the course and contextualize the research. Um, I will also do sort of a mini lecture of sorts that uh, provides a certain kind of trajectories, toolkits, templates that we can then explore in greater detail in consequent uh, sessions. Um, as I just briefly mentioned before we went live, um, this research that I'm working is very much kind of a living instrument and the term instrument is very important to me because ultimately kind of the theoretical exercises of kind of producing abstract concepts etc for me are only relevant and important so far as they can be somehow um, operationalized. So um, I have a certain let's say kind of political agenda or a certain uh, interest in operationalizing the kind of the constructs that I produce um, and I will make those explicit throughout this course uh, but what I also want to kind of get out of you is to kind of understand what your your agendas are and how uh, the kind of the templates, the constructs, the framework that I put forward to you can be potentially also useful in your practices. So um, with that, I just wanted to quickly kind of go over the structure of the course. So as I said, today is really uh, kind of the, the maximum information that you'll get from me in regards to the specific research trajectory uh, on the question of um, mediating freedom or the way that different strands of liberal ideology have been enacted through uh, what I call human rights regime and the contemporary art regime. Um, then we'll have a considerable break. So the next session, I think, is on, on the 12th of January. And uh, in part, this was a coincidence that this happened because we've got the New Year's uh, and Christmas, etc., holidays. But I also think it might be good because it might give you the time to kind of think through the stuff that will work on today, also to do most of the other readings that are assigned for the course, um, and to start really thinking about how you can apply or how you can kind of operationalize this within your own practice towards the final project. Um, also, if you're interested, and we can discuss this later, um, I am happy to offer kind of uh, group office hours in this in this break. Um, so for what I was thinking was potentially kind of um, allocating for uh, 40 minute sessions in which three or four people kind of would um, yeah, would, would sign up to and we can have a conversation about specifically about your kind of practice and what exactly it is that interests you uh, within the framework that I put forward. Um, as I said, it's, you know, it's kind of hopefully can be useful to you, but it will certainly be really useful me as this is really research in progress and the whole point of it is that kind of it gets uh, passed on really kind of modified um, and op operationalized in different ways. So then the next session uh, on the 12th of January, I mean in theory what I wanted to do um, was to kind of really zone zoom in on one specific aspect um, that interests me kind of or around which my, my argument like is basically is um, revolves and that's kind of the question of the divide that exists within both the project of human rights and contemporary art and in contemporary art it's much more visible and it is the kind of the division that exists between the infrastructural arrangements of the contemporary art sphere and uh, kind of the semantic uh, discursive uh, um, uh, arena rom through which contemporary art defines itself and uh, but what I want to argue is actually this kind of infrastructure semantics divide um, no longer really works and the, the reason it no longer works is because uh, the kind of the, the technosocial configurations that are reshaping um, the way that the world is ordered do not really re allow for that kind of lens to retain its um, kind of theoretical or mediational relevance and so for me that's really kind of the crux of uh, what we need to work on let's say if we are in the art field it's really kind of negotiating this uh, division that exists between infrastructure and semantics then for uh, the third session um, 
I want to shift into another direction. Uh, once again, it's very central to the argument and it's the direction of um, liberal limitations. And I mean, we kind of, I mean, I don't need to kind of recount all the recent newsworthy uh, headlines, which are clearly showing that kind of the liberal vocabulary or the liberal constructs that we have uh, in order to kind of understand um, the ethical political dimension of uh, governance or of progress or kind of some sort of future horizon, um, they are no longer really doing us any justice in terms of not having kind of the traction on what's actually going on. So I wanted to kind of zo zoom in in a slightly, I would say, sloppy manner because these things are emergent to kind of, I'd be curious to hear what um, Michael has to say about this. But uh, yeah, this is a very kind of sloppy um, dissection of uh, the, the things that are pushing up against um, liberal imaginaries but I will approach them through this concept of kind of weird configurations which are on the one hand um, ideological and also geopolitical but on the other hand are also infrastructural so it's it's the fact that we see certain infrastructures emerging uh, globally that seem to that have existed previously, like let's say the offshore infrastructures, but all of a sudden they're gaining a certain primacy and a certain kind of organizational logic that is um, primary rather than secondary to let's say our kind of ordinary understanding of uh, um, of the way the jurisdictions are split and the manner in which kind of business business as usual should happen. So. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of session three. Now the final session, uh, I will sort of hand over to you, and that's where we'll have the participant presentations, uh, your presentations. So um, there were a couple of kind of ways in, in which I thought about this, how we could do this. So I think one way is obviously for each of you to. Um, present for seven minutes, because I think that's all that we kind of have in order to be able to also give you some sort of response. Um, and there are really not many guiding criteria or it's not parameters, I said it, for what that presentation should entail, apart from a few, let's say, suggestions or, um, yeah, a few kind of very minimal parameters. The first uh, kind of the first parameter is that somehow I would obviously want you to engage with the methodology that I put forward or with the ideas that I put forward. But um, the methodological aspect is particularly important to me and I'll keep on kind of banging on about it, that sometimes it isn't really even about the, the, the actual narrative that I put forward, but more about the way that I'm thinking about these things. And I mean, the way that I'm thinking about these things emerges very much from systems uh, theory um, and systems analysis. So I would really want you to use this approach in order to uh, kind of tackle an issue or, uh, I don't know, an object or a speculative scenario that is of relevance to you and your practice. Um, the format of this presentation can literally be whatever, or the format of the object that you present can be whatever is um, closest to you given your practice. So maybe that's something we could discuss during the um, during the office hours. And can I, um, oh, now I lost myself. Um, maybe, I don't know how this is usually done, but when I want some sort of opinion from you guys, um, um, do I need to? <laughs> Because what I have is I have people on, I have people on mute to make sure that like things don't make too much feedback loops. So just okay. tell me, and, and then we may. So yeah, I just I kind of want uh, to know whether the office hours idea is, is useful, and I, I won't take it as an offense if it's not. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Uh, but yeah, okay. I'll explain to you how it works. It basically, like that's why I gave everyone in the in the initial email your direct email. So they can maybe arrange with you and then either chat with you on Facebook or whatever okay, you guys want to use, then you can just arrange okay, it great, on your own great, time. But so you know, great. So, no, one, yeah. uh, no one has ever gone over the board with it to, to the point that you have to say, I don't have extra time, but it's really up to your discretion how much you want to give to each student and how you want to regulate that. 
right? Okay, great. So I guess yeah. then what I'll say is that uh, um, after this session, I will write an email to everyone and I will suggest a few kind of slots um, that are good for me. <laughs> and then you can just fill in your names. Maybe I'll do it on a Google Doc. Anyhow, I'll figure out a system for it. But uh, but yeah, so we can we can discuss in greater detail kind of how you could use some of the aspects of methodology that I put forward, um, and in 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 relationship to your work. Now, um, so that's as far as I think the practical aspects are concerned. Um, Mo, is there anything to add in terms of the requirements that you have that we need to fulfill? And I saw mention of some uh, written exercises. Yeah, and you know, especially, it, I think because, you know what I mean, this is, an, this is a very good experiment we're doing with your class, which is like, using some time between the first session and the consequent sessions. For the next mm -hmm. semester, we might actually do every class will be every second week. To kind of like okay. space for people to unpack and, and decompress and then have time to actually produce because mm -hmm. we're realizing that four weeks or eight weeks in a row is a little bit like too fast. It's very intense, yeah. At least with eight weeks, eight weeks in a row, you have eight weeks to think, even though you have class every week. But with yeah. four weeks in a row, it's just like boom, 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 done, right? So we're trying to like reformat that a little bit. And this is a very good opportunity. People have like two weeks almost, right, away. To think so it's great if 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 we can ask people to give you a, give us like a two three minute thing on what they're gonna do and they can and basically we encourage people to write because we are getting in more and more into publishing and we just we're gonna relaunch our triple ampersand uh, publishing platform online you know we put out that book uh, somebody in a class came to the book launch at eflux right I have such a hard time with 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 Portuguese names like jo Joao, right? Yeah, Joao came to the book launch, right? So like, there's always a possibility of like putting things online or publishing things in print or online and stuff. So it's great to write and contribute that way. And also we encourage collective writing, which means like, and we're That's doing it now for two of the classes for Ray Bracer and 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 Ben Brand's class, the class make or encourage to write things that then can be plugged in together and turn into like collective writing and everyone can go over it and edit it later. So, but if people want to insist on just doing like um, oral presentations, that's good too. It's up to you, right? But, but um, we like yeah. text because there's something remains that can be kind of like... I mean, I okay. guess, the, I mean, the oral presentation, sorry, maybe I didn't make it clear enough. I think the oral presentation is a presentation on an object, but the object itself can exist independently, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I call it an object because it's not clear what, what it is. It depends on the, on the person's interest, on the person's, yeah, practice. So it can be a text, but it can also be, I don't know, what whatever else it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a text um but yeah um i think mo made it quite clear that it would be also quite good if people could collaborate um and uh once again that that's not something that i could engineer but uh we all have each other's emails and hopefully we can also get to know each other a bit more in terms of our interests and that could lead to some sort of embryonic collaborations which is always good and i guess as a selling point if you do collaborate you have seven minutes per person so if you collaborate with two people and you're three ultimately you have 21 minutes to present you don't need to use all of them but you potentially have uh yeah you potentially have a little bit more time. So um, now I kind of wanted to also kind of introduce um, myself, but just from kind of very basic information about myself um, and why, let's say, human rights and uh, contemporary art, right? So. Um, I, I have to admit, and this is kind of full disclosure moment, that one of the reasons why it is these two things or these two objects is because I've had direct uh, experience with them. So I used to work in the human rights field and I now work in the contemporary art field. So this is really stupid and blatant, right? And we're not, but at the same time, I think it's quite important uh, because kind of the process of being part of the systems has also led me to kind of reevaluate why it is that I entered them, uh, like the, the real reasons, the false pretenses, 
what it actually meant being part of them and why let's say I left human rights uh, for contemporary art because I thought that the contemporary art field is sort of a much more adequate place from which to do the kind of work that human rights wants to do but can't in virtue of its uh, rigidity and um, kind of overdetermination. Uh, but I also kind of want to hear very quickly once again, I mean, we had this unofficial sort of introduction of where we're all from, what we do, but I want to hear more specifically kind of uh, just sort of one sentence um, about what it was that interested you in this course and like, I mean, I don't want to go into this like thing of like, what do you want to get out of it, but, uh, but more, yeah, just kind of specify um, how maybe an aspect in your practice relates to this uh, particular course. So if I, I will do the same thing I did before, I will just call out names. Now I'll start from left to right. I did from right to left before. So uh, the first thing is if when people want to speak, just do do us favor and unmute yourself by going above the screen because I've muted everyone. So you won't be able to speak unless you unmute and then kindly mute yourself so the quality of Victoria's voice is enhanced after you finish talking. Thank you. Fantastic. So, um, Brian, can we start with you, please? Yeah, so, um, I don't know how to, I, I think that my practice does relate quite a bit to what's gonna happen, I think, in this course, but I don't, I'm not gonna be able to explain that. But just in a quick sentence, um, I, I'm I'm most interested in working on uh, how, in general, like the sort of de degrading, uh, basically, you know, the post-truth thing that's going on, how that's happening in different fields from art and then in media and and, and uh, in 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 other aspects, uh, how that's affecting subjectivity, how it's affecting uh, the development of people. And uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna. I'm not doing a great job at, at explaining. No, it, no, it's fine. That's great. Actually, what you're talking. Yeah, it really it speaks directly to something that we're going to cover as part of the third session, mm -hmm. and we might even have uh, a guest speaker who has done like an art well has done a lot of research on the kind of post truth phenomena. So okay. hopefully that will be really useful to you. Okay, great. So the next person is. Um, Okay, I forgot your real name again. Well, Choggies. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, you can just call me Choggies. Okay, great. Um, let's do that. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple of things I'm really interested in the work of Ron Sierra, uh -huh. and uh, I'm reading his uh, the, the Emancipated Spectator right now, and I'm really interested in um, how images can become sort of sites of agency and knowledge and action, and um, how certain types of images are sort of like. I don't, in this in the internet culture today you're seeing a lot of like memes and sort of very tame images and I think that there are specific types of images that uh, are sort of censored and filtered that can provide us with different forms of knowledge and actions and create uh, different forms of dialectics and I'm also really interested in the ethics and dialectics of pornography and um, how subjectivity is structured through pornography specifically in race studies and feminist studies um, so I think that this class is definitely going to contribute to both of those interests. Okay. Now that's super interesting because um, I must say that a, a while ago, Ron Sierra was, was my ultimate bad object. <laughs> so I'm going to like, but I've become much less, uh, yeah, much less, much less radical about it. I think one of the reasons like I, I had a lot of hesitation around Ron Sierra was uh, around this kind of, um, the aesthetic regime and the political aspect of the aesthetic regime and that ultimately for me the kind of the way that uh, uh, Rosarian theory was mapped onto contemporary art theory uh, kind of represented this divide that was produced through uh, kind of splitting the discursive dimension that emerges from um, from like aesthetics and from the image, from the infrastructural stuff, which is actually the kind of very trivial codes and practices of how the field is actually run. So yeah, so but I have become a bit less radical about it because I also realized the kind of the version of Francier that we have in the contemporary art field is a slightly bastardized version. Uh, I think uh, kind of Suhel's and uh, Andrea Phillips's analysis in the wrong of contemporary art of actually Ronciarian applicability to contemporary art is sort of the much more rigorous version. So maybe that's also something that could be interesting to you. Uh, and hopefully if you read the text, it'd be great to hear from you later on when we discuss the readings, what you thought about that. 
Cool. Cool. All right. So now I've got Christian. Hello. Um, so uh, my interest in the way that uh, the course has changed some uh, has changed um, just because my interests are still rapidly evolving. But uh, I'm becoming interested in the way that information is presented and the way that uh, in the package that information is presented, art especially, uh, the origin of the information can obscure, resulting in disinformation. Be interesting to figure out ways where we can pick up information and bring to light more of the origin and also sort of um, juxtapose contradicting origins of information and sort of uh, like uh, being able to present it in new ways. Basically coming up with new ways to give art and information a reputable, new ways of making it reputable and making new ways of evaluating the reputation of information and art. Cool. No, this sounds really good. Um, I, I suggest you also maybe look, if you're really interested in this kind of information, communication, art, um, kind of, you, you look into Luhmann. He's uh, assigned for, I think, week three, Nicholas Luhmann. Um, and he has sort of, I think his theory of information is actually really relevant to the way that um, information fields are kind of um, are engineered today. Uh, his notion of second order observation particularly. So yes, yeah, so maybe that's something that, that could, could be a productive kind of trajectory for you to trace if that's where your interests lie. Okay, Joao, I think you're next. Joao? Okay, sorry. I was yeah. just, uh, am I, can I be heard now? Yes. Okay, good. I had trouble unmuting. Um, well, I'm here because I was, um, I was actually really curious about the, um, the way you, you would connect human rights to um, contemporary art in particular, um, but also um, just thinking f thinking about the notion of um, freedom like within human rights and and again like the parallels between the two and also the the notion of um, I guess value in art, whether the source the the source or the kind of I guess the mystification of of the value of art being inherently one of um, freedom, a kind of indeterminate space of like you know unbridled subjectivity. So um, I'm interested in those connections, and I guess I'm also interested in then um, limits to freedom, and um, and also how um, quantification finance have kind of crystallized um, and and given a price to freedom. I guess this is kind of me just rambling, yeah. but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I totally understand. I mean, in fact, let's say kind of, um, you know, when I when I first did this research, it was at a, a very kind of emotive space. Uh, so the kind of the conclusions that I reached and that, I mean, you'll see a sort of shift in tone as I present. So some of the conclusions that I reached at the outset, they're sort of much more kind of, um, uh, how to put it, uh, if not radical, but they're kind of very sort of sharp edged. Um, and as I kind of started working through uh, the propositions that I was putting forward, I actually realized that what I'm ultimately interested in is um, understanding how um, this, this sort of understanding that, well, understanding how this understanding, but basically understanding how this framework could actually um, allow for um, new conceptualizations of freedom, ultimately. But conceptualizations of freedom that are adequate to the conditions of the present, present era and the conditions that are, uh, and the conditions and demands that are put on us by the future. And here I think financialization be became a very important aspect sort of, of the research that I was doing. Um, and uh, ultimately the kind of the next step, the, the stuff that I'm working on now, is very much in connection between what um, artist Gerald Nestler calls the derivative condition of uh, our kind of contemporary or our present predicament, um, and the conceptualizations of freedom that we need to develop through the infrastructures that we have, of which contemporary art and human rights are, uh, you know, two good examples. There are obviously different ones. Um, so it, it, 
for me, this very much became a project of kind of deconstructing ultimately, right, what human rights and contemporary regimes are, and then kind of on the basis that deconstruction, reconstructing configurations that could allow us to uh, kind of build new models of freedom. I mean, this sounds really, really ambitious and mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of <laughs> overly grandiose, but I guess, I guess you know what I mean, because freedom as well, it's a very kind of sticky uh, uh, term, in, 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 and in, it has a lot to do with its uh, history and with its kind of closely knit relationship to a particular kind of geopolitical formation, which is, you know, the kind of American hegemonic formation. Um, and, and I guess this kind of tied to geopolitics and history becomes also super important. Um, that's one of the reasons why I gave this Arigi reading. I mean, I think Giovanni Arigi's kind of conceptualization of the entire history, 700 years of capitalism, through this like really regimented, like long centuries of uh, hegemonic domination by different uh, kind of geopolitical forces from, you know, from Venice to Amsterdam, to the UK, to United States. It's sort of, it's like, it feels too simplistic, but then there is a certain kind of, I think, um, systematicity about it or logic that kind of allows us to think beyond what feels like a complete kind of cul-de-sac, a complete sort of, oh, we're in this uh, end of history moment that we have no tools to get out of. Um, so I, I, I'd say that, you know, this is something that I really want to explore kind of in my future research. So I hope that we can start kind of piecing this together as part of this course. Cool. Um, Okay, cool. Uh, Maria? Um, hi. So my intent for this uh, seminar and really my entire purpose for like my experience at the New Center is um, really based in like design and construction um, of, of an art practice of like the possibility of space of what um, an art practice, like a single practice can like what what can what how it can sort of sit um where it can sit amongst like other practices and how it could maybe expand or like re reconstitute itself and um hopefully through like the dissection of like what is taken for granted in art and like sort of going from there to see um, how things could be maybe different yeah yeah um no i i think kind of the sentiment really resonates with a lot of people and oh, well, at least like with people yeah. I'm surrounded by right now in the contemporary art. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like almost let's say um about let's say eight years ago this was this would have been a very weird thing to say. Um but I, I feel like right now through I don't know, a myriad of uh, circumstantial conditions, um this idea that you know contemporary art doesn't really do what it wants to do anymore mm -hmm. because the world has moved on <laughs> in part uh, and so but ultimately there is still some kind of attachment to art for obvious reasons and I'm very attached to it like um, despite the fact that I'm very critical of the kind of current regime within which it is lodged I'm very kind of I'm very I'm very attached I and mean, that's that's the reason why I'm trying actually to work on it to to the potential of uh, art but this also means that we need to kind of requalify how art sits within the wider constellation of what's happening um, and I think that project can only really happen on a sort of kind of quite rational and pragmatic ground I, I don't think it takes out like you know that the effective dimension of uh, actually mm -hmm. desiring change which is very important for any project and actually kind of the biases that go into one's desires uh, we, we also kind of like I wouldn't go with this like really sort of militant neo-rationalist approach that everything needs to mm -hmm. be just pragmatically instrumentalized but uh, instrumentalization sort of all of a sudden becomes cool and I guess now the big thing about uh, I think the big challenge is to understand what are we instrument instrumentalizing and how and for what um, so yeah, I think more conversations then to come on, on the subject. Um, now I've got Martin. Martin? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you, you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Martin, do you want to turn your video on too? My video is off for some reason. Okay. Um, uh, 
I got um, interested in this seminar when uh, Jason told me about it because I'm increasingly um, merging the questions of avant-garde resistance and political resistance together in my own research. Um, but my research is focused on the level of cognition. For example, um, uh, my current work uh, I came up when I noticed a strong connection uh, uh, in the ways in which um, uh, avant-garde art situated itself polemically against dominant culture through the deliberate use of a different model of time than dominant culture tended to use. And I'm speaking specifically of reversible and irreversible systems. Um, uh, and, and then I came to understand um, that one could read the relationship between classical music and jazz, dominant Western European music, and music that originated out of, out of uh, a mishmash of various third world cultural sources, um, uh, had pretty much the same kind of oppositional uh, polemics. Um, uh, in the celebration of contingency uh, chance and in with pre my particular interest in emergence. Uh, and so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at uh, that opposition at the level of embodied cognition in terms of neuroarchitecture and particularly with respect initially with the ways in which research that's been done in the, in the, in the arena of cognitive capitalism which uh, basically um, uh, looks at um, uh, contemporary <laughs> mediated society as in engaged in the increasing suppression of what they call bifurcation and the fact that jazz celebrates bifurcation and deliberately cultivates the capacity for bifurcation or what philosophers would call individuation. So that's kind of the frame of, uh, of, of what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with freedom, but I'm dealing with it at the level of cognition and looking yeah. at, at jazz, not because I want to valorize it over everything else, but because it's particularly visible within that realm. And so and particularly with the research that's going on in the, in the neuroscience of jazz uh, and neuroscience of music generally and jazz more specifically, it becomes really the perfect kind of thought experiment to ask certain kinds of questions about what constitutes liberation and for the ways that collectivities function together with respect to distributed cognition, for example. So that's basically uh, my issues, um, and it seems to me that I might have something to learn here. Yeah, I mean, I think more than you're learning here, um, I would love to learn more from you because I think we, I mean, a lot of the terms that you use in terms of kind of individuation or like what actually happens to the experiential aspect of jazz, et cetera, I think I, you know, these are kind of frames or terms that we kick around all the time in the field of contemporary art and that are very uh, fundamental and kind of core to the very construct of the kind of uh, ethical political uh, landscape of contemporary arts, kind of the yeah. notion of aesthetic experience, yeah. for example, etc. But when we actually start thinking about like what, you know, what is aesthetic experience beyond, let's say, the theory of aesthetics, right, that has developed right. over the last, well, there isn't really the new kind of um, the new architectural dimension which you're working on. And I think this um, makes actually the kind of the art argument much weaker in a sense because there is obviously kind of um sort of scientific um I mean, I don't want to kind of fetishize science here, but I think there, you know, there are far more um, specific ways in which we can talk about the art experience than the way that we currently do in contemporary art. So I'm also quite interested in uh, like a potential critique of this sort of experiential discourse in contemporary art, not just from the position that I'm critiquing it from, which is very much um, kind of a position of a false promise, right? Sort of, um, and I'll explain that later today in the discussion. So, in other words, what we're, uh what I'm, I think I'm, I'm hearing you say is that it's, it's not that that uh, you don't find this realm an exciting area to explore, but that you wish to engage with it at a at a m much more rigorous level than Absolutely. you're finding 
Yeah. Exactly, and through a different prism, right? So the kind of the current prism is uh, uh, it's what we imagine to happen when somebody experiences an art object, right? So it becomes a very kind of uh, you know you can create a lot of beautiful curatorial texts about it, but uh, it, it doesn't really say much. And I guess if we really want to engage with this topic, then I think we actually need the kind of specialism that you bring in in order to kind of more rigorously ground this conversation. In, in sort of in um, in kind of concrete determinations. So, in other words, I'm looking forward to this. Great. So, yeah. So maybe uh, now, if now, I, I'm I, I do have lots of um, demands on me. I, I can't promise to uh, uh, to come every, yeah. but I but I, but I will do what I it's, can to to participate. Absolutely great. I mean, whatever you can offer, we <laughs> I'll gladly accept it. You know, this and this thing. Hopefully, the various kind of links and collaborations that we strike through this, they can outlive the the four sessions that we have. That would here. be great. Yeah. So so that's that's good. Um, and now I've got Michael. Are you able to speak? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um. Well. I'm uh, really interested in uh, find. I'm doing research in Amsterdam um, uh, in by um, more of a commons discourse in the University of Amsterdam, which has gone through a lot of upheavals uh, lately. And so, this whole notion of developing new conceptualizations of freedom um, just seemed very um, intriguing to me. And because I have a more of a human rights background from my studies, um, yeah, I was looking forward to um, getting more of a sense of how you're juxtaposing this to the art world and um, what type of interdisciplinary debates are going on. And so, yeah, I'm just really curious in uh, what this can also mean for uh, let's say developing more, more of a, um, a complete picture for myself on what um, this can mean for so sort of the common ownership of, uh, for instance, knowledge and knowledge production in universities. Uh, what that could mean for um, yeah for um, the the um, yeah what we're going to just that's here. So, yeah, the freedom um, uh, in human rights and the mediation also of the contemporary art market. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the contemporary art market is definitely something that I'm uh, very interested in. And actually, Joao, who's here, uh, we had some interactions in regards to that kind of research interest of mine in the past. And it's something I continue on working on. But I think the more research that I've done on it, the more I have understood that actually the term market the way that we kind of use it in the contemporary art field uh, but also just sort of on a street logic level um, it tends to um, be quite reductive and kind of quite othering whereas um, I have kind of shifted much more towards sort of a more like a richer and more multifaceted understanding of markets maybe uh, let's say kind of read through the tradition of um, such kind of authors as Fernand Bradel uh, where the market isn't um, just about kind of exchange of goods and services etc but it's sort of a much richer kind of representation of what's going on uh, within society and and perhaps has kind of uh, more to it in terms of political potential if you actually start dealing with the kind of nuances and the uh, nitty-gritty configurations of it then it's immediately accessible and I think you know one uh, problem with kind of the notion of the market that we have today is that it's been very much kind of uh, um, uh, uh, it's been claimed by um, neoclassical economics and by kind of by mm -hmm. economic specialists, by quants, by people who are kind of well versed in its very mathematical lingo. But that's, a, I think, that's a very sort of specific understanding of the market, and particularly, let's say, the, uh, the the current capitalist market. But markets are much wider and much more generic structures. So um, when I refer to infrastructures, and let's say when I say the contemporary art field kind of retains this division between infrastructures and semantics and uh, kind of uh, discursive uh, discursive fields what it 
to a large extent, what I mean is that it tends to um, other its own market from itself. And kind of, I just, if, I mean, for very obvious reasons, that separation does not really exist. Things are much more entangled. I mean, the, the College of Contemporary Art is uh, uh, very much entangled in terms of, you know, as Joao mentioned earlier, the way that actually value um, is um, extracted, how value is extracted or produced, how it's uh, circulated, how it's distributed. Um, the more you start tracing these movements, uh, the less clear the separation line between just, let's say, purely economic market value and symbolic value, whatever cultural capital value become, or even, let's say, intellectual and knowledge value. And I think the sort of hybridity that is encapsulated by the market form is, is something that I'm very, very interested in. I mean, I don't know how much we'll get to talk about it in detail here, but I'm definitely interested in taking it up in greater uh, detail with you if that's what you want to kind of pursue um, in your individual project. So, okay, I think on this note... Uh, Victoria, actually, yeah. Joshua just joined us. Okay, great. Hello? Um, yeah, my name is Chris Dorn. Hi. I just joined you too. I had... Oh problems I'm sorry I'm sorry Chris um, hi so hi Josh and Chris it's nice to have you here uh, what we kind of did um, just now was I kind of gave a bit of an introduction to the course I also gave some basic information about expectations ethos etc um, I won't go over over it again for the sake of not losing time but I think what would be nice is if you could introduce yourselves tell us where you are and also why you are interested in this in relationship to your practice um, well um I'm auditing the class. Uh, I used to be a professor of religious studies, and I've become interested in um, uh, the New Center and its work. And whenever I see a seminar that appeals to me, um, I sign up for it. Um, I'm interested in financial uh, capitalism. Uh, I'm interested in... Um, the um, transformation that uh, the markets have undergone under the impact of um, communications technology. Uh, I'm interested in um, uh, trading, uh, especially uh, as um, uh, trading itself has undergone this revolution uh, due to um, um, these electronic platforms and how that affects uh, the, f the flow of capital generally, um, okay. especially the, cri the crises, uh, you know, especially with, with respect to the crises in um, the currency markets. Well, I mean, this is great. Do, do you follow the work of Muñez and Colón? Um, is that like, no, it's, it's like around market devices and these sort of the transformation? Yeah. Is, is no, that... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that author. I mean, I'd be interested if you could give me some titles, though. Sure, sure. I can, I mean, um, sorry, I don't want like, I'm sorry, I'm starting to start to sound like I'm completely sort of uh, uh, multiple personality disorder because I'm jumping from human rights to financialization. But actually, like, this, this what, exactly what you described is very closely tied to my PhD thesis. Um, and yeah, I can, if you're interested, I can send you separately sort of um, a list of, because I'm particularly looking at market devices uh, and their kind of emancipatory potential. Um, first of all, looking at how they operate and how they could operate within the contemporary art field, but then also uh, how the contemporary art field or the kind of the open-endedness of the contemporary art field could be used to modify their kind of um, pre-existing uh, kind of pre-existing protocols. So, so yeah, so that's 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 great to hear that there's someone who else who's quite interested in this. Um, okay, and I think we have one more person who joined us. Please reveal yourself. Joshua. Joshua, reveal yourself, please. <laughs> Maybe he's got having a sound problem. Maybe you should continue on and... Okay, cool. Oh, yes, he says he's, he's leaving and coming back. Okay, so continue on and maybe he can join us like a little bit later. Okay, great. So um, I will now kind of move on to the mini lecture thing. But um, I mean, I'm quite keen for you to jump 
at certain things and just ask me questions as we go along. Is the easiest way to do this through the chat sidebar? No. Yes. Techni technically, right? Okay, so let's 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 say that I will kind of speak at you. It's a bit weird seeing my own <laughs> reflection, I must admit. Uh, but I will try not to get distracted by that. Um, so if you have kind of questions, comments, things that you want and I'll, like me to elaborate on, please just uh, type in there. So um, I'm going to kind of start from a slightly kind of personal note, but it's a preamble that's kind of, it's, it's a very uh, generic narrative. Um, but at the same time, I think it will ground some of the more abstract stuff or kind of the urgency uh, around the kind of questions that I will raise later in, in, a, in, a, in a more kind of uh, tangible manner because ultimately when I start you know speaking about some mediation regimes systems analysis like understanding liberalism as an ideological pro project that is uh, mediated distributed through reproduced through certain specific uh, systemic configurations like human rights and contemporary art it very quickly becomes uh, like too abstract and not that's bad I think that's actually very useful to kind of abstract ourselves from the specificities of let's say lived experience but I, I also can't deny the fact that the lived experience part had a very big impact on why I started conceptualizing this in the first um, in the first place so kind of from the perspective of lived experience which as I say um, I don't fetishize it because it's sort of some sort of subjective position but uh, uh, it's quite I think indicative of a certain um, uh, trajectory of uh, its development from the late uh, 20th century to early kind of 21st century and the kind of transition that the world um, has undergone in the last um, 30 years. So um, I'm, I'm originally from East Ukraine, a city called Donetsk. I mean, some of you may have heard about it because it has become quite kind of prominent uh, in the news, although that has sort of receded in the last year uh, due to the various revolutions that have taken place and most notably the last revolution, which has then led to, I mean, didn't take place in Donetsk, the revolution took place in Kiev, in the capital, but that led to a series of kind of knock-on effects that kind of created, which Ukraine basically became kind of a battleground between different geopolitical interests. Um, and Donetsk uh, became a very important kind of strategic point where that battleground um, kind of attained uh, a certain kind of heightened uh, intensity. Uh, so this area, Donetsk, it's, it's an industrial area. It has a very kind of um, interesting, also very generic history in Soviet Union. Um, it is probably most famous for the fact that in kind of, it is a coal mining area that was one of Stalin's favorite cities because it kind of represented uh, the grandeur of um, the Soviet industrial development. Um, then kind of in the 1990s, another thing that became very special about it, but that wasn't so kind of visible or evident to the outside world, that it also became um, a space of kind of really kind of quite intense carving up through the primitive accumulation, through the privatization process of all the metallurgical and ancillary industries. Um, and I, can, I think the jungle laws are kind of, of the free market that were combined with a sort of this very kind of monolithic cultural and political ethos of the Soviet system, um, when they sort of mapped onto each other, they created a very ugly beast. So it became just the kind of the social said so the human rights situation in the area was very bad. So um, kind of from, from that position of the 90s, the kind of the human rights uh, discourse uh, became like a very, very attractive to, let's say, uh, agents from spaces like that, like myself, uh, who were interested in kind of uh, exploiting external leverages already pre-existing, let's say, global configurations uh, that could somehow give them leverage on a local level because um, there was no other way of kind of attaining a, a, any kind of political voice without having reference to an external system that has been already been legitimated. And of course, I mean, at this kind of very um, pragmatic way of thinking about human rights, um, only really came to me later. I mean, in, in, in the beginning, I was very much interested in all the, um, uh, I mean, I guess the kind of, the very evidently um, ethical aspects of the way the human rights discourse uh, represents itself. 
Um, but having kind of worked in the human rights sector, and I did a couple of projects that related to Ukraine and specifically to uh, um, actually the elections processes there. Um, but my most of my work actually took place in London in an NGO called uh, Reprieve. Um, I was dealing actually with a lot of death penalty cases in the US, but it's another story. But ultimately, kind of this process of being part of the human rights world, it led me to the conclusion that the human rights um, system kind of is um, too rigid and too um, kind of blind to the structural violence that contributes to uh, producing the very violations that we try to treat uh, within the human rights sector. Um, and it can't actually deal with the causes because ultimately in order to deal with the causes, you kind of need to understand the contextual circumstances uh, and you need to do some sort of work at the level of, well, emergence, origin, right, contextual uh, um, mediation, rather than simply kind of become, um, sort of fly in at the very last moment where, when violations have already uh, taken place um, and try to somehow ameliorate the situation through different forms of, uh, of retribution. Um, of course, there are different kinds of human rights work, uh, and there is a lot of kind of, let's say, preventative work that is done, and I don't want to disqualify that. But I think still kind of the, the kind of the, the uh, hegemonic uh, aspect of, or let's say the hegemonic self-definition of human rights is something that arrives post-violation. And so the fact that violation has already occurred is a very important aspect of uh, the conceptualization of human rights and the conceptualization of individuation that is inherent to the human rights system. So there were kind of four, broadly four reasons why let's say I, I left the human rights field. And one was what I already mentioned, this inability to uh, deal with the causes and to actually address structural violence at any kind of degree of uh, complexity and nuance. Two was, uh, um, this kind of very narrow templates for understanding what individuation could actually be. So the template for what individuation and freedom could be was um, legally prescribed and you could only really become a subject of it if you went through ju the juridical process. And um, that just felt too restrictive, especially in my then kind of quite, um, I would say, uh, yeah, kind of wanting individuation to be something more. And I think we all want individuation to be something more than just what uh, legally determined parameters allow us. Um, uh, allow us. Then the third aspect was uh, also a very kind of obvious thing, uh, and that's kind of the notion of the primacy of the individual and the um, kind of disregard of the communitarian aspect and the fact that communitarian kind of notions of um, social engagement are in fact primary in ultimately actually most non-Euro-American societies. And that ultimately when you bring this kind of um, framework of individual comes first and um, into areas which are not really kind of to which this concept is foreign, it feels immediately uncomfortable, alien, and imperialist. And I guess this is something that um, Mike, Michael Ignatiev, he covers in the article that I have assigned to you this week. Uh, that article is really interesting. I've been kind of rereading it for the last, I don't know, since it's been published for quite a long time. The first time I read it, I absolutely hated it because I felt like actually what the way that um, if Michael Ignatiev was sort of posing and defending human rights was actually the very problem of human rights. It's kind of inherent self-righteousness that's yes 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 you can all kind of have your critique of liberalism but ultimately uh this is like the only thing that we can agree on as kind of a global society like the basic alliance upon which we can agree and this sort of kind of self uh uh, some delegated authority to say what the baseline conditions for what all of us can agree on um exist like um uh, the, the sort of the self-delegation of that authority to me felt like the very problem of the human rights system, right? And like that's something that Michael Gnatif cannot address within the article where he advocates for that. But we can discuss this article in greater detail later. Um, and then the final thing that kind of really agitated me was the problem of enforcement or more precisely the lack thereof or the inability really of the uh, of, of uh, the system to kind of live up to its ideals uh, due to various um, geopolitical um, 
problems, but also due to the fact that um, at the local level, um, your ability to use the human rights framework largely depended on whether your issue fell into the interests of larger kind of uh, international, transnational um, 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 NGOs and uh, their agendas. And also whether or not you lived in a nation state that had a same semi-functional or at least like not completely and hopelessly corrupt uh, uh, juridical system. So the fact that, you know, in, once again, in most non-Euro-American countries and also within Europe and the US, uh, the juridical system is actually highly corrupt, but like the level of corruption within, let's say, a system like Ukraine is just beyond comprehensible. So um, starting a human rights claim on the basis of an instrument that Ukraine has signed up to uh, it, within the Ukrainian court, unless you're really being supported by an important external actor, I mean, that was just like, forget about it. Um, so the, these were the points of dissatisfaction, and they are, I think, very common amongst people who, uh, who leave the human rights field to do something else. Um, and uh, um, I think that um, it's, uh, as, as I said earlier in relation to contemporary art, like, uh, I think these problems, they, they are important, but ultimately what I came to is that they are very much integral. So the kind of dysfunctionalities of the human rights system are integrated into what it actually is and what it was meant to be. And we'll see that uh, later when I show kind of um, some of the diagrams uh, that sketch out the infrastructure of what uh, human rights, um, how human rights are actually enacted. Um, and then one kind of, um, the reason I, I moved into contemporary art was in a sense um, predicated on kind of positive responses or positive alternatives to the four problems that I outlined. So firstly, uh, you know, when I say that you can't really deal with causes and structural violence because you just don't have the language for it in, in the field of uh, human rights, um, obviously contemporary art is this open discursive space that is dialogical where in fact antagonism is encouraged and we can bring in all these different narratives, narratives that have been occluded due to certain meta-narrative that has become dominant, etc. And like this kind of discourse was really super attractive uh, to someone, someone who's from East Ukraine, from Donetsk, who uh, has like re where kind of the tension of the monolithic kind of Soviet uh, approach to culture, politics and ethics was so tangible and had become so kind of psychosocially embedded that uh, it felt like the only way to kind of um, start undoing that was through kind of creating this open, discursive, beautiful, dialogical space. And um, then the second kind of, uh, kind of response, so to speak, to the problematics of human rights, uh, to the narrow templates that for understanding what individuation is, uh, it was the fact that in contemporary art, and Joao alluded to this already, uh, you know, the kind of, the, the, the fact that we have the right to determine subjecthood, that subjecthood is something that isn't imposed on us, but that is, first of all, there is an infinite amount of subjecthoods and that individuation is uh, uh, something that comes as a result of one's own agency rather than something that is imposed on us, even if it's like, let's say, a beneficial kind of uh, 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 imposure, but uh, is felt also very attractive. It meant that um, subject positions could be hybrid, they could be mutating, um, you know, they could be whatever we want them to be. And to this sort of this freedom for it to be anything was, of course, very attractive. Now, the third aspect, the kind of individual versus community, uh, once again, although, you know, the, the kind of individuation and uh, power of ex individual expression are very important to the subject that contemporary art kind of puts into place or interpolates so to play so to speak uh, the kind of the, the dialogical space is very much kind of community based now it's an imagined community and I guess this question of like imagined and fancy will become quite prominent to me as an object of critique of um, in relationship to the system of contemporary art but still um, at least at the level of kind of uh, discursive agenda, the promise of community is much richer in, um, in the way that contemporary art imagines liberal, uh, liberal society than it is in the project of human rights. 
And now kind of the final uh, kind of upside of the contemporary art regime in relation to the human rights regime from that kind of very naive um, initial position that I had was uh, this idea that while there might not be any sort of enforcement, like legal enforcement in uh, uh, the field of human rights, there's this emphasis on this ongoing process of uh, working through things. And this ongoing process, which is ultimately kind of this indeterminate process, uh, once again, felt very kind of emancipatory uh, and um, something that you could work with in order to, well, for, for, for us to be taken somewhere where we don't know, but definitely better than the place that we're at right now. And I guess with sort of with, with this transition, uh, what, what happened is that, um, I, I co-founded a cultural space in Donetsk in 2009 um which kind of was very much based on on these ideological positions there were other different interests involved in this project which rubbed against these ideological positions but i don't want to go into this right now it's not really that relevant although maybe somewhat relevant um i want to share with you some images now so that like to make this a little bit more um entertaining i guess um so here it is so yeah okay um, so basically, this is um, this is the factory where the center was going to be founded. The center was called Isolata. It's a former insulation factory. Now, the reason it, the factory part is important is because, as I told you, Donetsk was a very industrial city in the 1990s. It went through a process of primitive accumulation. It also meant that the kind of economic networks uh, that were in place when the uh, Soviet Union was in place, uh, they broke down. So um, a lot of the industry was just kind of uh, either intentional made bankrupt in order to be rebought at nominal prices or just simply kind of uh, cut the production was cut down because there was a shift to different forms of um, yeah, industrial output um, and we kind of did the typical contemporary art thing you know where you kind of re-inhabit the space you kind of use the sort of signs that are Space in order to re to reimbue them with meaning, but the meaning that you imbue them with is sort of much more kind of deconstructive, critical, antagonistic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like you know, all the kind of like Lau and uh, yeah, move stuff and Ronciere, you know, redistributing the sensible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all lovely. Uh, lots of people, great. So, like, so we did this for a couple of years until uh, these guys showed up. And so, um, this uh, this moment, so this is where kind of the the most recent history of Ukraine becomes important. Um, this is the moment where. Um, uh, well, actually, this picture is from Crimea. So this is the annexation of Crimea that happened in March 2014 by Russia. And these are the infamous uh, green men on vacation. So the men without any sort of military insignia that kind of just ended up, like they just emerged in Crimea all of a sudden. And this was very much a response to the ousting of the then Russia-backed backed president Yanukovych, which was in part engineered by... Uh, by the US, obviously, but also very much engineered and kind of very much uh, wanted by a lot of people in Ukraine, particularly in Kiev. But like, as you know, I mean, these things, the way that these things map onto each other, like, um, is it's very complex and fascinating. Uh, but kind of, let's say the, the conclusion was that, um, uh, for us at least, that um, our place was taken over by uh, a militia from uh, southern Ossetia, which is a part of uh, Russia. And basically, we just had a couple, you know, guys, some guys with Kalashnikovs come in and say, well, you know, now you need to leave. And so our entire institution was kind of uh, displaced, and uh, people who worked for it were told to leave the city because um, it wasn't safe for them to stay there anymore. But the reason um, th this is not really for like, oh, look at what an interesting, fantastic story this is. I mean, this is actually quite, I think, uh, it, it's quite a generic story. At the same time, I think it's some, something, in, it's a very indicative of the shift that we're going through. And it is this shift uh, where um, the kind of the neoliberal framework that we have been all kind of living through, complaining about, etc., is now becoming displaced by something much more freaky. And I think one face of it is, is this. 
Um, but it also, like this particular incident, led me to kind of reevaluate the principles, uh, like the good principles of distributing, redistributing the sensible, open discursive spaces, etc., upon which um, that cultural project was founded. And I mean, for me, that cultural project was very, it was a very political project. So the big question for me was, what did we do wrong, like really, really wrong in order not to A, see this happening, but also to ultimately have absolutely no significance in what was going on systemically within this city. Um, and one of the things that I sort of started, so this is actually one of the militia guys, uh, uh, a Russian um, news agency, Dosh, they went in the uh, space that was um, that, that was expropriated from us. It was consequently turned into a prison and a torture space, etc. But anyhow, so this is a conversation with him where he says, this is not art for me. It really disgusts me to walk around this trash and look at this pornography. Uh, I mean, he obviously doesn't really care about um, liberalism um, <laughs> the way that we do notion of freedom from is something different and i don't want to like fetishize him somehow because i also think he's a bit of a red herring like i think these sort of um individual negative like fundamentalist responses against liberalism uh, they are like really good i think talking grounds on facebook but i also feel that they are red herrings because i think there's a larger systemic shift that is happening that we really need to understand uh at, at greater depth um and so for me in order to understand why uh, we got it so wrong. What I, one thing that I started looking at was actually what's the history, the systemic economic history of the place within which this project was given a certain amount of liquidity in order to exist, in order to do what we did, uh, in order to be this sort of like weird actor within an otherwise um, context that did not really understand what the fuck was going on. So um, I looked at the situation from the position of uh, the kind of the key economic ingredient of the space, which is coal. So basically, um, I mean, Donuts, it, 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 um, it's put on the map in, the, say, the modern age, uh, because coal was found there by actually British industrialist John Hughes. Um, and uh, it allowed, I mean, first, he, he was the first one to set up the initial kind of capital there, but then after the Russian Revolution, uh, it became a very important node within the industrial economic network of Soviet Union. So um, kind of coal-based and ancillary industry integrated into Soviet Union's logistical network and economic planning, that was that kind of, that was the phase from about, um, let's say, 1930s, roughly, I mean, that's when the kind of the industry really took off, until, um, 1985 and 1970s were really kind of good decade uh, for Donetsk. Um, the kind of just everything was going really, really well. In the 80s, things started going downhill. And then in the 90s, you've got this post-Soviet disintegration and the, the start of primitive accumulation, privatization. Um, and then, let's say, in the late 1990s after the space has been carved up in terms of like you know all the kind of oligarchs have been put into place also geopolitically the main oligarch in east ukraine has always i mean it's, it's not a mystery to anyone has always been supported by a certain faction of um russian security forces uh but then in the in the 2000s and we see this in a lot of the developing world we've got the emergence of this kind of corporate slick minimal beautiful neoliberalism so it's like this kind of emergence of free market ecology that um uh, um, that is already corporatized, so uh, it has a certain status within the transnational economy. Um, uh, but still, its kind of economic activity is very much based on its productive output. So, the kind of the, the place, the space, donuts, uh, coal mines, industrial production, they're still important, despite the fact that uh, these kind of the, the sort of the holders of this capital become far more complex. Um, uh, economic entities that are no longer just tied to Ukrainian jurisdiction because most of them are of course registered in different offshores have a lot of different holding companies you know very difficult kind of uh, not difficult but very complex uh, uh, kind of, uh, company structures and then what we have though through this through this kind of complexification of management structures um, we have private wealth kind of financially uh, being secured through portfolio investments and increasingly becoming more detached from locally situated capital and I would say let's say the, the kind of the art center came into being around the neoliberal phase 
that was very much like that was part of the kind of neoliberal legitimization of uh, the Ukrainian economy and of Eastern uh, Eastern Ukrainian economy, despite the fact that it was so heavily uh, influenced by Russia. But Russia was also very interested in becoming part of the neoliberal game for that particular period. But anyhow, so uh, but then what we have with this kind of disinvestment from locally situated capital, I mean, that's when the kind of militarization and the Donbas People's Republic, this kind of creation of this really kind of quite scary entity that is not part of anything happens. And in order to kind of illustrate this transition in a slightly more uh, visually vibrant manner, I'll show you the Donetsk airport. So this is the Donetsk airport. Um, and you know, the airport is a really important node in kind of representing what a space means in terms of its um I just want to say I I don't think it's updating the the screen is updating for oh. Is that what do you guys what do others see? You see the first. We just slide. see the first slide, and I was actually oh. interrupt you for some reason. Yeah, oh. now it's changing. Okay, so sorry guys, um, you should have, sorry, so patiently and <laughs> you're almost British, but thank you so much for telling me. Um, okay, so this was the factory, that's the contemporary art aspect. These are the militias, right? Is it starting to make more sense now? Yeah, so this was the guy who was from, it's updating now, right? Hello? Yes, it's updating. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so this is the guy from the militia who is not really into contemporary art. And then this is the sort of um, the, the, the diagram that I drew of uh, kind of the systemic transition that is matched by uh, kind of economic transitions and uh, the ultimate kind of disinvestment from the specific place where of the, the specific place which is Donetsk. So um, as I said it all starts from coal then you've got coal based in the Soviet industry integrated into Soviet Union's logistical network and economic planning that you've got post-Soviet disintegration and primitive accumulation of the 1990s then you have the kind of early Nazis emergence of free market ecology based on productive output. This is also the, the kind of the, the beginning of contemporary art. Um, and then you have private wealth that's financially secured through portfolio investments increasingly becoming less and less attached to locally situated capital. Um, and okay, so here if we look, um, we've, we've see the, the, the Donetsk airport, which was a very kind of a very vibrant airport in uh, uh, during Soviet times, and uh, that was quite unusual for uh, Soviet Union, and it very much symbolized actually the status of Donetsk in Soviet Union, because despite the fact that it wasn't a capital city, uh, it, its like ability to go to different parts of Soviet Union from this industrial kind of capital was 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 a question of status. Then there is another picture that should be here, but it's not there. Then there is the 1990s mo uh, moment where the infrastructure just becomes completely denigrated this thing is falling apart uh there are like just really overpriced uh tickets to very weird chart like charter flight tickets to various places um and like the whole thing is just covered in hideous posters and then you have the kind of the neoliberal phase where a new airport is built right next to the old airport. The old airport is not really integrated in any kind of strategic way into the infrastructure of this new thing. This new kind of slick, glossy thing is just plopped over um, in order to kind of signal uh, participation within the kind of neoliberal framework. Um, but once again, what's really interesting is that beyond the kind of this glossy, minimal, um, thing of, uh, of, of this kind of quite international, you know, this could be anywhere airport, uh, you still have uh, the very typical kind of economic um, ways of doing business, which is like they're the only airlines that were allowed there were airlines that belonged to, um, um, to kind of to people whom the, the, the various companies and oligarchs operative there would allow. So for example, Austrian airlines like uh, had some sort of like uh, monopoly on certain European routes and like it, it was impossible to get out of there for uh, less than 800 euros. So, you know, things like that. But then uh, this transition, you know, where I showed you the kind of the little green men without insignia. And I think Maria has just commented about Pomerantsev and Pomerantsev has actually written about 
about specifically about this. Um, so if you're interested, do look into him. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the aftermath. So this is the kind of post-liberal, post-contemporary art moment. Um, and um, I, I guess my, my, my question is very much tied to like the, the kind of the pragmatic reality of this, that um, if we have certain frameworks that um, are so kind of easily dismissed because they are integrated into uh, Kind of in, into geopolitical constellation ways that they don't actually have the agency that they claim to have. Uh, what what do we do from here? Um, if 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 ultimately the reason that say like that I do art or that I, I want to be in this field is uh, for a certain political cause. So um, that that's kind of the. The, the, the big question, but also what the kind of the narrative that I charted for me, um, it became really important because it, um, I, I started asking myself kind of quite big questions about how human rights, how contemporary art um, were integrated into um, these larger constellations, dynamics, uh, and but when I say we're integrated, I think what what became really important to me was to actually look beyond just what human rights and contemporary are prima facie. Um, and this is, I mean, in, in relationship to um, in, in relation to human rights, this kind of means looking sort of um, beyond the fact that uh, right that human rights are about rights, about ensuring individual freedom, individuation, etc., but also kind of looking at how the system that produces a certain conception of uh, individuation through the human rights regime, how it operates as an infrastructural arrangement. And I mean, similarly for contemporary art, instead of just like focusing, looking, kind of asking questions about contemporary art from the position of contemporary art objects and contemporary art discursive positions. Um, it, it, I, I wanted to understand how contemporary art functions as a system that includes sort of, that is as much about its infrastructural arrangements, its implicit and explicit codes, protocols, um, uh, and kind of um, you know, rules of the game as it is about art, art objects. And so, yeah, this this kind of became my uh, my overarching uh, question. So, um, the the reason kind of I started thinking about uh, this term regime was very much kind of I think it has a lot to do with the way that Foucault deploys this term and in this kind of intersection of uh, knowledge and power. Um, and that ultimately both kind of uh, contemporary art and human rights they are regimes that that produce certain knowledge as power uh, but it's not just power it's also a way like it's also a mediational regime because it, it just it's it's a lens on the world but a lens on the world that actively constructs certain archetypes certain objects um, and the way that construction is done is not just through, once again, as I said, let's say artworks and discursive positions or the particular um, uh, the particular kind of clauses that exist within uh, human rights conventions, but also through the very systems that that make uh, these regimes operative. Um, and I mean, the notion I think of uh, mediation is it's a really rich one, and I, I mean, I guess I use it in quite a limited way. I, but I'm, I, I'm I'm quite conscious about the fact it can be interpreted in so many different ways. But um, the the two kind of definitions that are most relevant to kind of my analysis is um, it's how do it how sort of mediation um, produces certain images from that say uh, now this is very simplistic understanding of it but from certain kind of raw data you have a certain image that is produced and you take that image as a reflection of uh, things as they are so that's one way of kind of, of, of understanding mediation the other is much more rooted in um, in the way that mediation is used in law and uh, as probably most of you know the mediator in law is kind of this sort of supposedly neutral uh, agency actor that is meant to resolve a dispute between uh, two parties and the mediator is um, the reason the mediator can actually resolve a dispute is because uh, 
he or she, they uh, um, are neutral and the only reference point that they have um, is a certain kind of legal statute, certain kind of rule-based uh, logic. Um, and, but ultimately, the, the neutrality of the mediator position is, uh, it, it's, it's not at all, basically, the mediator is not at all neutral. I mean, he, he or she or they uh, derive their legitimacy and authority from a very particular ideological uh, formation. And um, the kind of, the, the understanding of human rights and contemporary art as these sort of mediators that derive their legitimacy or their content or their code from very specific ideological formations is actually basically the binding that kind of, for me, um, makes them correlate. Uh, on a sort of structural level, then more concretely, the reason they correlate is because what they mediate ultimately uh, are different forms of individuation, different ways of understanding, well, individuation for our freedom. So the, um, as I started doing my research around uh, how contemporary art system regime and how a human rights system regime produce certain forms of understanding individuation, um, I kind of moved to the conclusion that um, what we need to understand about both human rights and contemporary art is ultimately that they derive their legitimacy, their kind of uh, ideological landscape from uh, different liberal traditions and of course they, there's a plethora of liberal traditions and like there's no purity in terms of how they're applied with the different different governance uh, uh, setups etc I mean they're all much more interrelated than like let's say my kind of slightly clinical approach would um, uh, puts forward but still um, I think there's an important distinction um, that exists between human rights and contemporary art and for human rights I mean, it, human rights are a form of um, they, they're ultimately a legalist project of uh, a certain brand and I mean legalism is um, kind of a branch of liberal thinking that places um, its faith and its kind of um, yeah ultimately its faith in decision making capacity and governance and um, the kind of the space where uh, through which individuation can happen I mean that space is the legal space it's the juridical procedural space of where law produces justice ultimately or law is the path to justice and law is also the path to individuation um, and human rights kind of represent this very sort of dry, procedural, rigid way of understanding what individuation is. Um, then for contemporary art, um, um, I kind of associate contemporary art, with, with, and I will show you, I will discuss this a bit more later, with um, a, a conception of market liberalism, where once again, the market, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's not just this sort of really kind of stripped down neoliberal market um, or, or kind of or even kind of the neoclassical conception of the market but it's a much richer place I mean what is what's kind of exciting about this sort of the the market within the contemporary art condition um, is the way that contemporary art condition puts it forward is that there is it's a space where uh, individuation can be self-determined um, and that, that's really kind of the crux of the argument. And um, I then kind of moved forwards to uh, sort of developing kind of a scheme, right? And this is, once again, I, uh, I say this is very, uh, it's, it's all quite intentionally schematic in order to kind of chart a territory, a toolbox. And then we can really take it apart and, you know, make it a bit more, um, yeah, maybe a bit more nuanced and, um, not not so clinical. So um, at the first level, right, because individuation ultimately within both the human rights conception, the contemporary art conceptions as liberal conceptions, they both relate to the subject. So the subject that's kind of put into place by the human rights regime is already kind of a violated subject. And I, I think that's, that's, it's very important to kind of understand that because um, what is taken by the human rights regime is the fact of violations, the fact of certain transgression that does not allow for individuation to take place. 
Now, that's a very narrow and very rigid and uh, not particularly accurate description of uh, kind of subjecthood within complex social situations at whatever age. Um, and I mean, the fact that that concept of individual has been attacked, uh, individuation has been attacked uh, uh, so violently kind of over the course of, let's say, human rights visibility since after the Second World War. I mean, it's no coincidence. And we see that um, really prominently in the My Michael Ignatiev article where he's trying to kind of shield this particular line of critique in various ways that ultimately lends him to this kind of pragmatist approach uh, that this is, this is kind of what we need to have in order for this to be an operational system. Uh, but um, I think part of my argument is also this uh, this fact that the contemporary art regime has kind of taken over from the human rights regime in, I would say, kind of early Nazis. Um, its primacy as like as the more relevant framework for understanding individuation within within or specific, within that moment. And the reason I think that happened was it had a lot to do with. Uh, once the kind of the critiques of the human rights regime, uh, because of this over the violence of over determination, um, and simultaneously uh, a, a desire to actually understand subjecthood in more complex ways and uh, to understand subjecthood through difference um, rather than through kind of some sort of unitary uh, set of criteria. Um, then, um, but then, kind of. Moving onwards from the subject, um, equally as important is how both how both regimes um, position the relations uh, or conceptualize the relations between the subject and the system. So, in the in the context of the human rights regime, the way that that relationship is positioned is through proceduralism and through a very kind of long term time commitment because. Uh, um, ultimately, I mean, I guess this is kind of unspoken truth of human rights. The retribution for the violence for, that you have incurred from some other party, it, probably you won't really be a direct beneficiary of it. I mean, in the best case scenario, there will be some sort of um, more kind of systematic um, retributory uh, compensatory mechanism put into place, but m most likely many decades later. Uh, so this time lag becomes uh, another kind of um, uh, soft spot, another um, if potential uh, weakness of the regime when um, the kind of proclaimed ethos of that regime is protection um, of uh, human dignity and of individuation. Then with the contemporary art regime, and then the system really kind of fades out. So um, the system is something that that is usually in contravention of uh, human individuation, hu a kind of human ability to different to be defined by difference, because. The, the system has a certain oppressive character. It is, you know, it, whether it's capitalism, whether it's uh, kind of hierarchical structures of uh, organizational uh, behavior, et cetera, et cetera. But it's sort of this, the, the system is not something that's a good object within the contemporary art regime. Um, and, and that's uh, quite convenient because obviously, you know, everything outside the contemporary art regime is usually very kind of systemically determined. Um, and so the fact that contemporary art becomes a certain refuge from systematicity plays in, uh, I would say, in kind of contemporary art's uh, favor. So the system also becomes something that individuals can actually imagine through their interaction with art, through their kind of participation in the system, through their um, kind of agency as, let's say, as, as producers, artists, curators, etc. Um, then uh, in relationship to the image of the world that the two regimes put into place, uh, the kind of the human rights regime really parcels out the world into nation states and this is kind of international westphalian uh, model that um, also makes it highly kind of unattractive and you know irrelevant in an age where um, 
this the kind of the sovereignty paradigm is not only put under question by kind of critics of sovereignty but also by yeah, alternative structures that become kind of more powerful whether it's corporations uh whether yeah but the corporations is the big one uh certain actors become more powerful in determining what the world really is then uh, but in the contemporary art uh regime the world is once again, very similar to the system, is kind of whatever you imagine it to be. Um, and this sort of uh, indeterminacy is at once what makes it, uh, I guess, much more relevant than the human rights regime in the early 2000s, yet at the same time, it's kind of the thing that makes it least potent as a sort of potential political force uh, in, the current, in the current phase that we're in. Um, now I just wanted to give you a bit more information about the human rights stuff, also kind of understand that probably most of you, I don't know, I mean, maybe you, you, know, you, you know more than I do about human rights, but just to give you kind of a very quick background, I mean, just like with, you know, the contempt with art or contemporary art, I mean, there are different art worlds, obviously, you know, and the, when we talk about contemporary art, we mean a very specific, I think, transnational constellation network of, um, uh, of institutions and, um, ways of uh, producing, disseminating, talking um, about art, but also about the world. And similarly with the human rights sphere, I mean, I don't want to say that the kind of the system that was put into place in the aftermath of the Second World War um, is really like the only kind of human rights system that exists. I mean, they're, they're different also, they're, they're different subsystems, ecosystems uh, of human rights that have existed outside of this time frame, but also maybe certain uh, human rights kind of institutions um, that are not as uh, kind of directly related to this model um, as kind of the ones that I will be talking about. So here we've got um, like a really kind of foundational moment for uh, represented here for the human rights regime. And this is um, Eleanor Roosevelt holding out the Universal Declaration of um, Human Rights, which was uh, drafted and um, signed by, I think, by all states uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Now, kind of getting this document through was a huge... Uh, battle uh it was uh, on on many fronts but um i mean the, the kind of the romantic the, the romantic uh, interpretation of why it actually ultimately went through was of course the kind of the the, the feelings in the aftermath of the horrors of the Second World War, right? So that's kind of the, they kind of spurred on uh, the delegates from these different states that diverged on so many ideological position to actually ultimately agree on this, uh, on this draft and on these set of basic rights. The less, um, uh, the kind of the less um, romantic vision uh, has a lot to do with um, um, with kind of the role that the US was going to ta take in the next 50 plus years and very much had to do with the need to actually create an abstract human legal subject uh, that could also become the kind of foundation of um, economic uh, economic policies that ultimately kind of uh, the US was interested in and um, I mean I think this kind of this juncture where um, the human rights regime meets the kind of market liberal regime is super important and it's also really important i think for contemporary art because i think without uh the creation of this abstract human legal subject that was deemed to be on a par with the state at the international level the kind of the idea of transnational contemporary art uh sphere would actually be impossible um so um so uh, here, uh, when, here we also have like these um, kind of set of basic freedoms. Uh, what's important to note about them is uh, that most of them are so-called negative freedoms. So they're uh, freedoms from certain um, 
from something happening to you. So they're not actually claims on something. Uh, and this distinction that was noted by Isaiah Berlin between negative and positive freedoms uh, became a huge sticking point actually between um, uh, this, the Soviet, the Chinese, and then the American delegations because ultimately uh, the kind of this, the socialist project was invested in. Um, positive freedoms, although from a completely different kind of ideological lens. Um, then this, uh, one second, it's very, hmm. Hmm. sorry, guys, are you one second. Are you trying to scroll to the down to the next slide? Yeah. How do I do Just that? Double click it. In your slide window, double click it. Uh, did that work? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about this. Um. Yeah. I'll get the hang of it <laughs> soon. So anyhow, so um, as you saw, the United uh, the the the, uh, the declaration that you saw before, um, it was an intention, uh, an in, sort of intention uh, setting document. So actually, did not carry in legal force, but it did give birth uh, to the United Nations Human Rights Treaty System. Uh, which is um, kind of a portfolio, ultimately, of different international covenants uh, that became binding once uh, a nation state would sign up to them. And so the two kind of critical ones are uh, that uh, are the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural and Cultural Rights. And this is the one that attends more to the positive freedoms and has been actively suppressed in, uh, um, in kind of in circulation. And then uh, the ICCPR, which is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that's the one that has kind of received uh, most uh, circulation, most applicability. Um, and within this kind of diagram, what you see at the top, there are um, different um, um, uh, different instruments, uh, so different uh, treaties. Um, at the bottom, you see treaty bodies, and these are kind of committees within the UN that are responsible for monitoring compliance by nation states with these different. Um, uh, with, with these specific treaties. Then the stuff kind of in the middle with the arrows uh, where you where it says kind of reports, uh, individual complaints uh, it, through optional protocol one, optional protocol two, the, these are mechanisms for compliance. And I guess the crucial thing to understand about this, which is <laughs> the most basic line, this has never really worked. So ultimately when like the system was kind of created for a world that was no longer when it came into being. Um, there are some really interesting arguments tying the inability of the system to adapt to the geopolitical conditions of the post-war era with the kind of disintegration of the Bretton Woods Agreement. So uh, I, I find that parallel quite fascinating. I'm not entirely sure exactly, like I, ha I don't have a completely kind of rational tracing of cause and effect, but it does kind of uh, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. But despite the fact that this has never really worked, what it did create, and this is the thing that I kind of referred to in the beginning, is um, a reference point for the creation of regional and local kind of ecosystems that fed off these uh, kind of um, mediated conceptions of individu individuation and produce their kind of own regional, um, yeah, regional, uh, regional infrastructures. So now I'm gonna click back. Um, and here is, um, well, I hope you can see it. Yeah, can you see it? Okay. Um, now, so this is the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and um, the kind of the, the reason I'm sharing this system is because it's actually one, it, it's one of the most functional ones in terms of uh, the fact that it has delivered judgments which were consequently then, uh, which have consequently then changed uh, national law. Um, and, and that's actually this feedback mechanism where an individual claim uh, can sort of um, stack up or scale up to a level of a decision that has an impact on the way that uh, uh, legislation is formulated, applied and enforced within a nation state. I mean, that's a very powerful mechanism and one of the reasons why you know, people like Theresa May really want to get rid of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I won't go into details of this, but if, if people have questions after this, I'm, I'm happy to explain it in greater, in greater detail. Um, now, 
another kind of uh, interesting fact about what the human rights system ultimately led to was this kind of inversion of um, agency uh, from, let's say, if within let's say, the standard human rights paradigm, you've got the subject uh, that is the sort of small person who uh, who is at the brunt of the Leviathan, the state, uh, and we need to protect the person from the state, right? There are only these two parties, and now they're kind of weakness and um, of the human rights regime, because obviously there are far many more parties that are relevant uh, to, to violations. Um, with the emergence of the International Criminal Court, uh, we've got the inversion of that relationship. So now we have this kind of super agency uh, where, I mean, now since already for a while, we have the super agency where supposedly kind of one individual, especially if they have kind of a high chain of command, so they kind of occupy a privileged status within, within um, um, within a certain organizational setting, governance setting, they may be uh, indicted for certain uh, particular grave violations of others' rights, so crimes against humanity, genocide, acts of war, etc., um, by the International Criminal Court. Now, this system is quite embarrassing, I think, for <laughs> for a lot of, let's say, uh, reasons, especially from the perspective of post-colonial critique, because ultimately only people who have ever been really indicted and then uh, successfully indicted um, are various kind of mid-level militia men from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, right? So kind of, and then, you know, if we look at which are the states that are signatory, uh, parties to um, international criminal court, we, we see really interesting patterns. So we don't have Russia there, we don't have the US there. Uh, what's interesting is that there are a lot of actually um, states from sub-Saharan Africa that are um, that are opting out from uh, the international criminal court from participating within the system. And I mean, I think once again, this is a very kind of speculative uh, idea, but I think this is a lot to do with the, uh, with the fact that China is increasingly, has increasingly been becoming an important kind of geopolitical agent within the African continent. So the kind of system that was imposed on the African continent through decolonization of which, let's say, the International Criminal Court and the various human rights conventions were kind of a package that people had, well, that states had to sign on to, it's because it's, it's sort of, it's falling away and no longer really becoming, uh, no longer really being the relevant um, set of references, like geopolitical references. And um, so this is a very kind of thin outline of uh, what the human rights regime conceives of uh, when it comes to individuation and how that individuation becomes uh, kind of, uh, produced and is distributed through the infrastructural arrangements um, of, of the system. Now, I think for contemporary art, I'm not going to say that much because uh, most of the people here kind of know about it. Um, and I mean, this is a very a caricature form of just saying that um, the kind of the primacy of the subject position and this kind of idea that agency sort of emerges from within us um, that is very core to the contemporary art uh, paradigm it, it's it's at once obvious um, it's obvious through the kind of interpolation mechanisms of the exhibition experience and let's say people like Suhail Malik have wrote about a lot about it but it's equally obvious let's say in the in the way that um, the self-determination of subject of art uh, works. So ultimately, you know, contemporary art, what contemporary art is, just ultimately depends on the determination that you as a subject within this regime uh, give to it. Um, but I also wanted to be a little bit less reductive and also think like, well, what, what happens when let's say, infrastructural arrangements from which contemporary art disengages uh, become the very subject, let's say, of, uh, of, of, of art. And I think there, there's, sort of, there's a weird kind of dissonance that takes place that on the one hand, uh, infrastructure becomes the, the subject. On the other hand, 
what is still left occluded is the kind of more immediate infrastructure within this representation of infrastructure is lodged. And um, I mean, once again, this is very schematic and very kind of um, reductive, but I'm, I'm very interested whether, like, let's say this break can at all be uh, manipulated, and I think it can be. Um, and like what I'm moving to now is an interest how actually the sort of uh, relationship between um, representation image um, of let's say artworks and discursive positions are tied it I tied into the infrastructural arrangements of which they are part in ways that are very intentional strategic pragmatic you know you name it um, and so for, for me this is kind of uh, research um, about mediation regimes, human rights, contemporary art as mediation regimes of their liberal uh, trajectories um, was, I mean, firstly, it was kind of an, in the, in the beginning, it was an attempt to understand what actually, what's actually happening. What, what are these things actually doing beyond the, beyond what they're, what they say they're doing. So it was a very kind of classical uh, project of, well, let's kind of deconstruct this. Let's actually um, understand what the reference are, uh, what are the different components of these systems? How did they work? Uh, and let's sort of abstract this into some sort of theoretical framework that may be reductive and hence not accurate 100%, but at least it gives a more kind of grounded understanding of where, let's say, as a practitioner within a field like contemporary art, I'm actually standing. But um, I would say that um, now I am particularly interested in how having kind of, for myself, understood uh, these various kind of components of contemporary art as a mediation regime and the lessons from human rights as a mediation regime because I, I mean I don't want to pronounce his death but let's say let's be honest about it it, it kind of has died um, I'm interested in seeing how the space of contemporary art the, the linguistic the infrastructural kind of the spatial can actually be utilized as a platform or as a ground for um, for a kind of production of speculative models, um, I mean, I call them prototypes, um, that are directly related to certain issues that the human rights regime was trying to address. And I mean, the issue that interests me most, and um, I'll talk about it in the final session, is the question of kind of post-Westphalian, post-nation state, post-UN citizenship, but also uh, how um, we can use the kind of the infrastructure or the kind of the the this this network of contemporary art as a ground for lobbying, and lobbying is I think is a very important aspect of political practice that I, I think is often neglected within uh, contemporary art kind of constructions of what political practice is, um, and I mean lobbying is much more strategic, pragmatic, instrumental than more kind of romantic notions of political struggle. And I feel that kind of the way that contemporary art is sort of you know totally compromised and meshed uh, in in certain with uh, kind of with the neoliberal regime, while the neoliberal regime is still sort of here, because yes, we're kind of seeing it dying out in various uh, spaces, like let's say the space that I'm originally from. But ultimately, um, it's kind of there. There is a group of people that is very very. Uh, invested in maintaining it for as long as it, it can be maintained. And so for me, it's very kind of important to think how the still available space of contemporary art uh, as a mediation regime can be utilized to think through new speculative models. Uh, and so I have these kind of these three sort of images that are kind of meant to allude to this transnational and generic status of the contemporary art space. Uh, space understood in kind of more than just physical space, but also sort of space of knowledge and space of action and um, and also the replicability that's uh, granted through this kind of transnational distribution. Um, and yeah, so the kind of final uh, conclusion of this sort of mini lecture is that um, having kind of understood the way that liberalism ties in or is uh, kind of produced different strands of it that are produced, mediated through contemporary on human rights, understanding that let's say the contemporary art paradigm is the more relevant paradigm if we want to do something around kind of notions of speculative notions of freedom and how these would infrastructurally function in the future. Um, 
we need to start prototyping stuff. And I mean, I guess the notion of prototyping is really around a lot right now. And I'm not the only one saying it. I, like I was at another seminar where this notion was just kicked around. And I guess there's just a certain urgency that is kind of um, becoming ever more stark about the need that like, yeah, okay, we need to actually produce actionable frameworks. So um, hopefully this course can be somehow tied in with the production of actionable frameworks for some of us and for others hopefully it'll just kind of function as um yeah as well as whatever you it needs to function for you guys so this is like this is it as far as the kind of very condensed lecture is concerned uh i'm gonna stop sharing screen how how do i do that you just hello? To go back to the hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Sorry. So I'm I'm looking I'm looking here now. Yeah, you need to go back to the green button, and basically, uh, or there's something up there on your screen that says stop sharing. Oh, it's there just me now. Yay! Fantastic. Okay, good. Oh, sorry, guys. I haven't been really looking at the sidebar. <laughs> sorry. Sidebar will be a good place to start a discussion because people usually post questions there or like ideas that can be further discussed. Great, fantastic. So maybe we can do that. Um, also, sorry, Mo, I have somehow uh, taken the kind of the, the the bottom bar where I see all the participants out. Do you know where do I? Oh, show participants. Yeah, no, got it. Everything great. Um, okay, so. Uh, I, maybe we should be unmuted now to have a more fluid discussion. Does that work? Yeah? No? Silence? Hello? I have a, I have a question. Uh, I, I was wondering if you could uh, respond. Um, it seems to me that uh, human, uh, human rights discourse uh, represents um, a, a lonely, deracinated uh, individual um, who needs to be protected or um, defended against uh, the larger community or collectivity. And um, so do you see, does contemporary art address this or respond to it in any way? I mean, does contemporary art mediate or represent new forms of participation or belonging that um, human research, human rights discourse really doesn't seem too congenial to. Yeah, I mean, I think this is very crucial, actually, um, because I think this this kind of um, notion of participation, belonging, community, that's, um, I mean, I think it's very inherent to the contemporary arts discourse, especially institutional discourse. So, uh, you know, if, if we look at the way that institutions, contemporary institutions frame their um, missions, it's very much around this kind of engagement of community and uh, di different modes of participation, etc. I mean, the word different is just like, you know, it appears everywhere. We're not really sure different to what, but I guess like, let's say, in part, maybe implicitly different to the sort of, as you said, um, very beautifully lonely, der deracinated individual. I mean, here's a human rights regime, I guess, maybe in the contemporary or critique, it would be the lonely der deracinated individual of uh, you know of a capitalist neoliberal uh, urban space so um, I think belonging participation community feature very very prominently in the contemporary art discourse and yeah so that's that's a very but the question then becomes do they actually like what is this actually achieved and I think the answer um, to to, to to this question, it's 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 a very it's a very complex answer because I think at a certain to a certain extent it is achieved like within the immediacy of a particular setting. Uh, I think uh, I, I mean I can imagine there are a lot of or a lot of, kind of scenarios that are produced curatorially or, or through um, kind of artistic engagements that do definitely kind of produce this effective. Um, quality of being part of something 
But I think the, the, the problem that contemporary runs into is when it translates the kind of that experience, the microcosm of that experience, and kind of claims that it has some sort of higher political value within the larger societal context than it really does. And this is one of the reasons why I showed to you this example of the culture center that I used to run, because when we were doing these kind of participatory, community-driven, uh, kind of site-specific projects with various artists involving a lot of people in it, like local community, et cetera, et cetera, um, we felt very much that like within the space where we were doing this, this was really, really important. But in fact, the function of what we were doing, let's say within the larger constellation of where the city was economically, politically, geopolitically, socially, culturally, it was something completely else uh, than the kind of political meaning that we were ascribing to it. And so when I started looking at the system and what was happening within the city from you know, this kind of projector that I drew uh, from you know coal capital in C2 to uh, financial interests that transnationally distributed. What happens is that at that stage when financial interests become uh, kind of transnationally distributed, what happens with your immediate beautiful local you know heartwarming place is and so for me the question is okay well we take that as a given even if it's sort of hard to swallow for some people, and maybe maybe it's not even 100% accurate in all contexts. But for me, it's interesting to say, we take this reality as a given, what do we do with it now? I mean, can we actually mold something different out of this space of participation than what the standard claim uh, around that space is today in contemporary art? I hope that kind of makes sense. Okay, thanks. Um, I had a little technical so, difficulty. I had to go and come back. Okay. Um, also, I mean, I, I would be really keen to hear your feedback. I mean, either to this, but also to the text. I mean, did the text provoke kind of certain questions? I mean, the texts were not really meant to be uh, illustrative as such. On the contrary, I have a lot of problems with most of them. <laughs> but uh, but they, I, th I think they highlight certain aspects uh, of the vision that I have kind of presented. Um, I don't mind putting yeah, that, 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 words if you don't mind, so, because as you know, we've been we've been talking about this stuff together, yeah. and actually, the idea of doing the class came out of like several conversations in person and online, right? So my yeah, totally. My, my and I think this this is the type of trap, invisible trap, actually, that or like glass trap or glass ceiling or whatever you want to call it, that contemporary art world has that actually can maybe be expanded or see how does this trap works in basically works in uh say human rights world right which is how the trap yeah yeah how this invisible trap operates right yeah so basically uh somebody left i hope they come back anyways uh also, I just wanted to say before I start that, that I basically lost my session because my computer crashed and I had to like kind of like keep the conversation going using my phone and then come back. As a result of that, I've lost the sidebar text. So if you can copy it and uh, save it, so then we can post it to the classroom because I lost it. This, this okay. sometimes happened. So just, okay, yeah, so basically, the, and I think you might disagree with me. Like I'm qualifying what I'm gonna say like so much, it's so annoying, right? But I feel like I have to do this. And I think you might disagree with me. Uh, and I think, I think, I think indeterminacy actually, it, the, uh, contemporary arts indeterminacy is actually uh, a fake nicety. Because actually contemporary art has this like, invisible determination which is the political will of the cosmopolitan elite who own or operate or both these institutions right yeah. and indeterminacy is a place where where all sorts of uh oppositional determinacies can be wasted or or neutralized and this and 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 um and a form and, and and one kind of determinacy, which is the determinacy of the art world, or maybe one or two, which are needed for any kind of like vi like minimum amount of openness and democracy, will finally, you know what I mean. So all you get is like uh, basically uh, 
Claire Bishop fighting about uh, relational aesthetics with with like uh, the relational <laughs> aesthetic people. So that is allowed, right? But but any other kind of like determinacy is not allowed. And and but but this. But but how these type of determinacies are deflected and neutralized is actually through saying there is no determinacy. So so the so the so the so the fact that determinacy doesn't exist is itself a mirage, and actually there is a determinacy. That's just it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it there is a and then and then and then in the human rights discourse is the same as you can see. You know what I mean? Like I mean I mean I'm just gonna give like a very like a recent example of it. Is that you know what I mean? Like. Thousands of people are dying in, say, Yemen, but Yemen is a war that is conducted by the allies of the United States, which is Saudi Arabia. So you don't see, like, consorted effort by BBC, uh, even, like, all the way to Democracy Now! and Nation, which are left-wing magazines, who are constantly talking about the massacres in Aleppo, right? But you don't see the same set of same set of rules applied to human rights in, in Yemen because that's the war that is, you know what I mean? Like, in fact, these two join at the hips because the Yemen war is being fought against, it's a proxy war that US allies are fighting with the same people that the, that the Syrian war is a proxy war, which is Iran and like Russia and all that stuff, right? So basically, yeah. basically the human right itself has this like glass limit. Of how it can be. I mean, and yeah, and I, I kind of alluded to that. I think uh, in 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 br brief mention in the very beginning that ultimately the visibility that's gained by let's say local human rights issues very much depends on transnational international agendas, and these agendas are set quite the way that you have quite rightly pointed out by uh, dominant geopolitical interests, and they're also set by the interests of NGOs. And the interests of NGOs, transnational NGOs like Amnesty, etc., it's a, that's a very slippery subject, and there's been a lot of really good like stuff written on it, because also for them, it's um, an economic mm -hmm. game. It's, yeah, it's NGOs number one agenda is to maintain the funding so the NGO can actually exist. And I mean, it's rightfully so, right? Absolutely, I mean, I think that critique I agree with it to a certain extent. I think it kind of uh, it really diminishes the. Uh, I think I, I think it's a bit too blunt because I think yes, that's true. But it's the fact like about absolutely every single institution and about our own lives, about everything, right? So I do. There is something to be said about the fact that um, let's say, especially humanitarian intervention that isn't even necessarily military but is actually truly let's say humanitarian i mean what it tends to produce is that it tends to produce certain uh, artificially created and kind of externally flown in crutches for uh kind of a certain social situation that still produces the kind of violations that become the uh, raw materials or the context for violations that become the raw materials and the bread for a future climate of human rights organizations. So, I mean, I can see this very well, let's say, in Ukraine, uh, the way that like human rights organizations, they slowly started percolating in the 90s and the early 2000s. They completely boomed after the Orange Revolution. And now they're like, it's just, they're all over the place. And guess which, I mean, this is also quite interesting. Big, yeah, this is, I mean, to me, this is super interesting. Guess which discourse right now gets the most funding in Ukraine? It's the LGBTQ uh, discourse because ultimately it's very much rooted in this kind of notion of progressive Ukraine. And what you need for progressive Ukraine is like, a, like kind of that, that, that works much better, let's say, than uh, kind of providing a lot of housing for the internally displaced people who had to flee uh, Eastern Ukraine. So the, the politics of funding funding and like what aspects need to be kind of turned on and what aspects need to be turned off and a certain kind of representation of these local societal settings which to a distant onlooker you know from whatever like from somewhere in the US or Australia or France or whatever uh, it signals like you know what you were just saying about let's say Aleppo and Yemen I, I don't know the situation so I can't really speak to it but I can completely believe that that's exactly what's what's happening uh, precisely because of how politics of visibility uh, works within the human rights regime and but I think this the question here is to how to nuance the nuance the idea of indeterminacy really I brought this up to, to basically
talk about how we can nuance the notion of the indeterminacy because of course we can like you know and, and the reason why i was blunt was that that like that there's a way to sort of like nuance uh indeterminacy in the art world because we know it's not really that inter indeterminate and then how this can help us to nuance indeterminacy in the context of human rights and i'm going to stop talking at, at this point because i think we only have like 15, 15 minutes. minutes yeah i mean to, to others this would be also a good moment to open up to like to other people have uh also suggestions or comments in regards to what mo said or perhaps they want to kind of take it on a different uh line of thought and please speak up because also i can't see you so i don't know i can't point at you you didn't get no. the icons up or you did did you get I do. I mean, I see people, but like because I can't see them, you know, kind of corporally. I no. I don't can't read anything from their body language. <laughs> this is very contemporary, but yeah. Um, Can you hear me? No. Yeah. I just want. I don't have a question, but I just want to register that I'm here and can be heard. <laughs> very good. Very, uh, very good. But the I th I think though the um, the issue of indeterminacy is is slippery because I think it has to be located in the indeterminacy of value within a market system and there's always there's always a kind of like determined it's like the way that I guess like materialize indeterminacy materializes is in the material effects of that indeterminacy which I think was what Mohammed was getting. To which is it's used as a lever of power by those who, who are institution builders or have a particular agenda and want to use contemporary art towards this agenda. So certainly it's like a it's a mystification or a smokescreen, and yeah. and the only way to kind of get get to the indeterminacy is to go through like what what material what, like what material reality do we have to deal with and and then like backtrack through that. You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. I think that distinction needs to be drawn. I completely agree with you. I mean, I think the mystification of smokescreen stuff is really important because I, when I drew that chart thing with uh, contemporary human rights, what it does about, you know, what it says about subject, how it mediates subject, system, and world, it, effectively what I was alluding to were forms of, yeah, smoke screens and mystifications that are not always necessarily like explicitly intentional and hence sort of manipulatively evil but that that become kind of certain byproducts of the affordances of the system vis-a-vis -vis the needs that these other actors that you're rightly mentioning uh have in, in relationship to the system right so um but the question of indeterminacy for me it's i mean i understand the need to kind of to get into more nuanced understanding of it but i also want to approach it from a more kind of personally pragmatic aspect and I feel that if there is a possibility to actually use it as a lever of sorts for a certain project I I mean at this stage I don't see anything bad about that it's just like to ultimately it really depends what um, I mean, I'm going to the very dangerous ground here, but I think it really ultimately depends what the end game is and I guess maybe one of the uh, Things that I'm interested in exploring now is how to create kind of more long-term strategic projects within this very kind of itinerant it, 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 it and kind of ad hoc uh, um, existence of contemporary art, um, and and maybe the indeterminacy stuff then gets almost sidelined because if you do have a cer certain kind of consistent project that you're kind of working on and, and a kind of enlarged understanding of project, um, a a component, a lever that you sometimes kind of uh, exploit in order to get, you know, in order to get ahead w w within this project. Um, does does that make sense, Mo Chihuahua? Well, yeah, but uh, yeah. I was gonna say, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, you know, like, and this 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 came up in Guangzhou with uh, with Andrea Phillips, right? Um, what like I mean, what do we expect? Do we expect better art or do we expect a better utility for art in a larger cultural, political, economic, you know, scientific, epistemic, sort of like cosmos, right? Because these two don't necessarily always go hand in mm -hmm. hand, right? Not at all. Sometimes, sometimes actually the 
the better art, because you know what I mean, like better art, and now we can argue what is better art, is produced under really exploitative situations where everybody's unhappy. You know what I mean? Total political oppression, right? And like total like massacre situation sometimes create really great art, but doesn't necessarily mean that that great art is put into any kind of like larger utility. I, I totally agree. I mean, and then in human, because I, I want to keep this parallel that you did, because I think it's important, right? Yeah. In, in human rights, also, we can also think of human rights as like human rights as such for human rights sake in that particular, in a particular like uh, instance, or the way human rights can be utilized for something larger and larger being maybe geographically larger or geopolitically larger, right? You know I mean, they I mean? have been. They have been. I mean, this is like the thing that I did not mention was the most obvious thing: the way that have that human rights have been used as a discursive framing for uh, geopolitically targeted humanitarian intervention, right? So that's like that's a way in which they were used for something larger, and actually, maybe that's actually the way in which Definitely. they have spread the best, right? And this is like a horribly cynical way to put it, but ultimately, it's through this like highly uh, violent and imperial mode of uh, uh, distribution that let's say within their self-representation they would be completely like the, the very ethic of human rights is against that but that's exactly how they've been deployed given the circumstantial settings within their within which they're lodged so to me i think the question like the question that you're posing is super important um and that and also something that i can't answer without i think knowing two things and two things that i would need to know is one um this is where actually the, the kind of, I think the more personal aspect becomes important is like, well, what do you, wh what are you doing? So like, what's, what's your investment? And um, I, I, you know, and ultimately the reason I'm drawing this parallel between human rights and contemporary is because my investment is in a societal function. Um, so I guess for me, the societal function, I would lean more towards like better instrumentalization or let's say more strategic, more smart, more pragmatic, more kind of long term, long game instrumentalization of art for something that's uh, societally beneficial. But uh, at the same time, I think we can't answer that question for a second reason that we also need to understand the conditions within which we are currently lodged. Right. So um, because that will give us an indication as to how uh, kind of contemporary art as a regime is moving through this process, dynamic process of evolution of which we're part, um, that is techno-social, right? And like we need to understand what the techno-social infrastructure within which this evolution is lodged are about. Um, and yeah, and I mean, I guess, I guess this is also something that you know really like quite a lot about and quite invested in and like, you know, so many modules of uh, the new center, I particularly dedicated to kind of understanding, coming to grips with the techno-social infrastructures uh, and modes of governance within which we're currently lodged. I'll, 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 I'll give you like, kind of like my modus operandi, right? As, as, a, as an art professional or whatever you want to call it. It's like, it's like from the very beginning of a, of a project, whatever you want to call it, right? I keep track of both its sort of like as suchness and its utility. And then and then and then and then exercise some kind of like contingent decision making in which you slowly realize that this is a project in which it's best operable as sort of like as for the good of art or for the good of utility. And then as it moves forward, you basically make a decision to that this thing works better in which direction and then you you may take it to that direction but you have to constantly keep an eye on it you know what i mean is this going to be a great piece of art or this is going to create a great community is it going to bring really people in this uh, around the exhibition together and generate conversations and have some kind of pedagogical or political effect or oh my god this is such a great art piece who cares if it doesn't bring community together who cares only if 10 people come to the opening who gives a shit right so it's but, but I, I keep an eye on it, and and I'm don't I'm not gonna like favor one over the other in the last instance, and I'm just gonna let it go. But there has to be some commitment in the last instance, as you realize that where the potentials of this is, right? And then you kind of like commit to that end, or or sometimes perfectly magically, you have a project which is a great great work of art, and it actually does have some kind of political or social or you know what I mean epistemic function.
So this is sort of like, but I don't know how to translate that in the larger human right uh, um, paradigm. But I know in the art, this is how I would do it, personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, let, let, I, I have some comments, but I also want to see whether some people have some responses to Absolutely. this. Guys, let's not do the silent thing. <laughs> okay, at the risk of sounding vain, I want to mention a project that I come across at come across in and I think um, is actually going to be really important. It's um, it's called Scepter and it's basically like building a meta cryptocurrency where it diversifies mechanisms which you can pr like print currency, distribute it, evaluate it, notarize it and whatnot. Um, and uh, one of its biggest principles is unenclosability. So anybody, if a certain paradigm of currency production, wealth evaluation uh, is something that's not to your taste, you can make a fork and make another one. So so um, I'm thinking possibly, I really think that this project's going to save the world, but like, like for example, you could, uh, in building a new social network, um, or more of like a meta social network where it's all decentralized, you can have different institutions that notarize specific types of art or origins of sources, and then um, you can... Um, or uh, from there, you can end up building actual communities that end up looking at the actual utility of things and how art pieces end up actually producing these sort of conversations and increasing that value. So, um, and with that, uh, as as we move further in that direction, where more and more of the the content that we view is evaluated in these terms, uh, people who are intentionally intentionally neglecting like committing human rights abuses and whatnot can be barred from engaging in commerce in this network. Um, I, 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 th I find this route rather promising. Mm, I mean, yeah, I, does anyone know more than me about cryptocurrencies, <laughs> about the discourse around that? Well, basically, fundamentally, it's, um, so, um, we like with, with, uh, so, with the Aleppo crisis, for example, or like what actually what Mo's saying with Yemen, um, uh, how that's not being covered in a different social media network, we, we could make up and pioneer new governing organizations that are able to notarize or give reputation to certain pieces of information in entirely new ways. What this will do as more as it picks up, um, uh, as it picks up more people, um, I, I think it will end up producing more good material consequences for everybody who's involved in it. That's a good pitch line, which is important to have. Um, I actually, th does anyone have an immediate response? Uh, no, just I, th I think block. There is a lot of promise for blockchain technologies, and um, I mean, I I could bring up an example like I've been in um, some preliminary conversations with uh, your and my collaborator with wage and the wages I don't know I could talk about what wage is um, produce produce kind of minimum minimum standards for artist payment and services and and um, and sort of reversing reversing um, the onus from one where it, it rests on an institution to provide payment but one in which the artist could um, use blockchain to um, attach it to a, a, either a digital or a physical work and that being a kind of a, um, a blockchain archive, a decentralized archive where, um, where it would produce transparency for work of art. But of course it required massive implementation, right? You would have to, you'd have to have an entire field take it up, right? Which I think is similar to what, I don't see your name there, but the, the last fellow who spoke. Um, Christian. Christian. Christian, yeah. yeah well, Christian yeah. said, um, but I guess he was focusing more on its potential within the humanitarian field. But I think there are ways of, of um, adopting this yeah. technology. But, but again, I think there's also a lot of conversations happening around, um, despite the decentralization, is it hackable? But also, um, who ultimately controls that infrastructure? I know it's designed to be completely decentralized, but those claims have been made before about different systems, you know, in the past. Yeah. 
But I think as an infrastructural, like kind of modus operandi, once again, I don't know, I don't understand it that, I mean, I understand it, but on a very kind of superficial generalist level, but from my kind of very basic understanding, what it also does is that it binds kind of um, infrastructural arrangements with um, processes of value creation that are usually complete lack, lack transparency, right? And this, I think, this sort of um, unison is like within the context of the contemporary art field is what feels kind of most, um, yeah, m most productive and potentially kind of most um, revolutionary about it. Um, and, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm super interested to hear about that project more. So maybe we can chat about I, it a bit. Um, yeah. This is Christopher. Um, Hi. This is an incidental comment um, in response to what Mo said about his um, process. Um, I'm not an art practitioner, um, and I don't know too much about aesthetics, but it seems to me that um, the artist doesn't ask necessarily about uh, utility. I, I mean, that seems somewhat confusing to me. Um, I mean, the, the, the act of art, it seems to me, is a, a communicative act, right? It is a response to uh, um, forces or trends uh, which the artist um, feels um, maybe more keenly than the normal uh, everyday ordinary person. Um, but once that art uh, product um, is um, released, um, it takes on a life of its own. I mean, if you were to, um, if you were to uh, um, couch this in the terms that uh, hermeneutics gives us, I'm thinking especially about Paul Ricoeur here. Um, the, 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 the subject of a work really has no control over how it's received. Once it's released, it becomes subject to a conflict of interpretations. So I, I guess what, I, I don't know how this relates to what we're discussing here, but that's, uh, that, that's a thought that uh, Mo's uh, reflection on um, process um, evoked, evoked in me. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, I, I, th I think there's a lot of kind of truth to what you're saying in terms of reflecting how that, so the general conceptualization of, let's say, art as a communicative act that is kind of embodied within a certain object form and then passed into an ecology that takes it on a, its own kind of living trajectory. Um, I, I think that's quite a kind of common and very potentially accurate, not maybe in the sense that it covers every single instance of how work is produced, but it, it certainly has kind of a, a track as far as kind of generic description is concerned but for me the question is um, well is is this who who does that kind of system actually ultimately benefit um, and I, I don't necessarily see anything kind of intrinsic about the need for that split to happen uh, once let's say artwork becomes part of an ecology um, and you know it, it just, I, I don't think that it's, it makes a lot of sense within um, kind of capitalist commodity culture and the way that kind of ownership works. But if we actually kind of uh, abstract ourselves from concept of private property, it, 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 it doesn't, it, doesn't feel like an absolutely kind of necessary uh, way of for things for for kind of for an ecology to function. And I mean, there there are good examples of uh, also you know of this trying to be subverted. And I guess the kind of the example of Joao that put forward of wage and uh, what, what wage does and this sort of this blockchain project, but also kind of older projects by. Um, uh, people like Seth Sigalab who tried to, to attach certain rights to the circulation of artworks that would allow for artists to benefit from consequent sales, resale of this artwork. And I think um, 
there is something about the kind of openness of the art field to investigate this relationship, uh, what actually happens, let's say, to an artwork when it enters this um, supposedly mystified indeterminate field of contemporary art. And what I am, I guess, saying is like, let's let's use, let's utilize this indeterminacy to actually model uh, ways, dynamics that are not operative within, let's say, normal capitalist markets. So that I that that would be kind of my direct response uh, to 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 what to what you're proposing. It's also ten o four at uh, here, <laughs> so that's quite late. Um, so I wonder whether we should kind of draw this to a close. Um, and I idea. think we started kind of like we started like ten or twelve minutes late, but you were you were here on time, so. Maybe maybe people want to like remember if we have this type of quorum next time we can just start on time so we don't have to run late. But the class time is two hours and a half. So, but it's always kind of hard to get people to show up on time. But please, people, it would be amazing if you show up on time because Victoria is in a totally different time zone, which is England, and it's getting too late for her now. And I'm sure the last class would run a little bit long, so we can catch up this 10 minutes or eight minutes that we're missing. I mean, we're still running, so. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The last class, I mean, I'm, I'm, the last class I'm hoping will be longer because we'll have like time to discuss your uh, presentations. And so that will naturally run over time. Um, so would so you be on this tell me the sidebar so I can post it right after. So then I'll make it available immediately. Just select the sidebar text and email it to me. But, but as far as the class, is concerned if people don't have final remarks I can stop the broadcast and archive this and then we can just slowly fade out can I yeah let's let's okay so yeah One final thing so thank you everyone we had a great first class I'm gonna stop the broadcast